world. Hello. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this is I'm the not the best. world, but I'll be a stand-in for a moment. <laughs> Will you be my pepper? Oh, this is so <laughs> amazing. Uh, thank you, Hal, for joining me today. Episode one in the book so far. This is a long time coming for me. Uh, try, just trying to get this thing going. I, I've been wanting to talk, do a podcast for years. I think we've talked about it at work several times and had a couple of false starts on it and so forth as we've gone along. Uh, and I wanted to just get something going. And this is it. Finally, we are here. I couldn't ask for a better guest for episode one. The expert, the guy that does all things digital that knows so much, uh, Hal Werner. Keeping it spicy. <laughs> Keeping it spicy. <laughs> you know, this is either going to go down as one of the greatest podcasts ever with uh, a talking to a pepper, or it's going to uh, be horrible. One second. I got this weird warning here. Uh, yeah, okay. So, I'm sorry. New tech that I'm working on here, and it's telling me that I'm having all kinds of other issues of recording and whatever. Anyways, so recording check, we're in. So uh, this well, I'll, podcast, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'm going to do because I know this has been distracting in calls that I'm on sometimes, and I do want to make sure people hear the message. So now that I've made the big impact entrance, I'm gonna, you're gonna see the real how. I mean, this is my inside self, like this is my heart and my soul. Uh, spice a little pepper here, but um, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna get the the outer skin. That's what we're gonna get now. There we go. I love Here's it. the man. There he is. Uh, and he's got the Roger bots in the background. I love it. So uh, if that's no indication, if you're not a marketer and you don't know who Roger bot is, um, this guy right here, Hal, is a SEO expert and who I go to on a regular basis for all things SEO. So I wanted to spend some time today to just kind of talk about SEO, PPC, the world in general around uh, you know how, how you're handling work now and how things have changed over the years and so forth. So um, if you want to jump in, uh, I don't have any specific questions right now in terms of like, where do we start? But if you want to jump in and start talking about kind of the things you do as an expertise in the areas that you're, you're impacting. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Mike mentioned, uh, I focus on SEO, PPC, and uh, CRO. So the, the complete alphabet soup of digital marketing for some people. Um, and really what it comes down to in the simplest terms is getting people to a website and getting them to take an action. Uh, and as, as with most things, the simpler it is to say, the harder it is to do. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance in a very crowded world out there. Um, you actually sent through an article earlier today, uh, that's, you know, not great news for SEOs that this trend of Google, uh, keeping all the clicks to themselves is increasing. A couple of years ago, I think it was 40 or 50 percent of all searches on Google led to not clicking through to a website. You either staying on the search engine page or going to a Google property like YouTube. Uh, and I think the article you just sent through said it's now up to like 65 percent or something like that, right? Yeah, I think it was at 64, 65 percent, which is kind of crazy because you, you know, when you start thinking about that, you you have to do so much work in building web properties and and putting things together as a website to then have Google just basically steal that traffic from you. Uh, because if you don't, you know, if you don't do those things right, then Google's not going to ever display you, right? They're not going to ever display any of your content in terms of answer boxes or any of the other uh, rich tech stuff that they put out there to help people. Uh, which from a user experience, I mean, it's kind of weird because it's like, it's a toss up. Do you, do you, you know, from a user experience, it's fast, right? Like if I Google, uh, the address to whatever, right? Like a tire shop or something. Uh, mm -hmm. Google's going to tell me right away. Like I don't need to go to, even if I don't have a Google My Business set up, right? Like Google knows and has found my website and it's going to search, uh, show those results. But they're not going to go to my website. So like maybe there's like a coupon or incentive or some other thing I'm trying to do with my website. But it's crazy because you have to spend all this money and time to do that for then Google to just be like, no, we're just not going to send them to you because we're going to give them the information right here on the page. So, Yeah, uh, I think some of it's a bit dodgy and some of it's probably a gray area, right? Some of yeah. it, um, it involves doing a preview, essentially, 
Um, so to some degree, you want something like a meta title or a meta description to show up so they have enough information to know if they should click through. Sure. But there's also instances we've seen in the past where they've essentially taken all the content that you would need, scraped it from a site, and just displayed it right there in the search engine result page. And you can argue whether or not that constitutes, even if it's good for a user, whether it constitutes essentially, you know, IP theft, um, them monetizing someone else's content and website. So there's a lot of people debating about that stuff. Um, but I mean, I think what a lot of it really comes down to is we're seeing the same thing on all the social networks. People have built the platforms, they've built the massive audiences, and now that they have the massive audiences, they're monetizing it. And they are taking away more and more of the free reach. Facebook is doing the same, Twitter's doing the same, Instagram's doing the same, because they want you to pay to get your reach. And they can do that because they have the audience, right? It's just like TV used to be. You gotta pay sure. to get in front of those people. Uh, digital's unique because they built these platforms um, initially, whether or not, you know, I'm not gonna pretend to know the intent of these people, but initially they felt kind of altruistic and that, hey, we're trying to help you find stuff better on the web. And they may still do that. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, these are giant companies that wanna make money. So they're going to try and push you to things that make them money. Yeah. So I'll be really curious to see if someone can make, you know, in the next five or 10 years can make a real push as an alternative search engine um, or, or alternate methods of payment. I mean, we've actually already seen stuff in, uh, we've seen stuff in Australia where they basically said, oh, Facebook, if you're going to try and be, you know, getting your monetization off of all these news sites content, then you have to compensate them in some way. So there's lots of different ways that this could shake out, um, whether people like Google just aren't allowed to use that content or whether they have to provide some sort of compensation. We're really in the wild, we're still kind of in the wild west phase of all this stuff. It's really just like the industrialists back in the, you know, the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, they figured out cool new stuff to do and it's transformed the world. Uh, but slowly but surely, the cracks have arisen. Um, sure. Things that are not amazing for society have arisen and people are starting to figure out how to address those. Yeah, uh, you mentioned alternative search engines. So probably, uh, I don't know, maybe six months ago, uh, I adopted using DuckDuckGo. Um, I started seeing a lot of things in, in Google when I would search for stuff. Um, and it was, I'll just be honest, it was around all of the stuff that's going on with COVID and the presidential election and things like that. I was really looking for unbiased news decisions, like news reports, so that I could go in and read some things on my own uh, and, and make sure I had a good informed opinion about all things across them, right? So you know, I think we've all experienced seeing, you know, the clickbaity articles and so forth from everybody. So I, I noticed on Google when I would search certain topics that it would only present to me like one viewpoint. And it seemed like it was one viewpoint from Google. And I'm so down the middle of my politics that uh, I, I want to see it all, right? I want to see the good, the bad. I want to see the crazy, the, this way, crazy, that way. So... I found that when I would go to DuckDuckGo, it was giving me more of those results. It was giving more, less um, uh, curated results. It was more of just like, here's what we found. You figure it out. And at first, it was a very abrasive and weird behavior uh, and experience for me to like search something and then have it come back with, it, it, it almost felt like it didn't work. You know, because <laughs> I was so used to the way Google would just serve me all this information that that they felt like I needed to know, and I think I've become accustomed to either seeing or or needing. Uh, a good example is um, you know location based stuff, right? If you again looking up mm -hmm. a tire shop or something, and you go and you look it up on on DuckDuckGo, the location services aren't automatically turned on, and you're going to get a list of websites that are that are tire shops. You're not going to get the like big scroll at the beginning that's like here's all the tire shops that are close to you uh, and you just click on one and go to the maps. Like there's a, there's a whole other step of enabling and, and so forth that goes into that. So it's really weird for me because I, you know, from a privacy perspective and from an information gathering perspective, you know, I, whether Google, you, anyone wants to argue whether Google's doing crazy stuff or, or things that to push their own agenda or whatever. Uh, but I felt like when I moved, went to DuckDuckGo, duck, duck, it was, it was more of like the early stages of Google that, you know, weren't so curated, they weren't so sophisticated, it was mostly just, like, you search this word, 
this is what we found. Uh, <laughs> even if it's on, you know, crazywebsite.com uh, that has zero, you know, meaning uh, and it's all fake, whatever, we don't care. Like that, the you you found they they've optimized and and there you are. So it's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for me when I start looking at search results. It's like, you know, uh, yes, I want Google to help keep some of those fake crappy websites and help protect me as a user from going to places that are going to try to steal my identity and like, you know, different websites that are going to, you know, throw a thousand pop-ups and ads and stuff on my, on my uh, computer. But also I want like the freedom <laughs> to go and just get what I get, you know, uh, from a search yeah. perspective. So it's, it's a weird, it's a weird dichotomy there. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's simply, I mean, that's simply part of life. I think I think part of where we are with it versus where we thought it was going to go was all of the sci-fi related stuff, even if it was just a little side piece of a show, like a little throwaway line about something, always assumed this reality where the personal assistant would be a piece of software essentially installed on your own device so that only you had access to it. And I think that's a version that people would be very comfortable with uh, if if that software is on your device or even like on a server in your own home and accessible over the cloud and not sending that information back to anybody else. However, um, the computing power required to do these kinds of tasks today seems to rely on these sort of mega server centers. Mm -hmm. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I'm not the tech expert, but at least that's how it got started, right? Um, and, and so that's the model of today is it's not just a little private thing on your private device that's helping you out. It has to go off to this company to help it. And therefore, in order to get these kinds of benefits, you have to give up that privacy for it. And and so as long as that's the case, as long as it's not a privately hosted thing you know, on your own device or your own server, and it's hosted by Google servers or Facebook servers or whoever's doing the hosting and the computing, um, that's just going to be the case. You're going to have to make that trade-off. Now, like you said, there's some real advantages, right? Um, if you want more personalized results, you have to give up the information. If you're traveling around the web and you're like, why are you showing me this stupid ad for pom-poms? I'm not a cheerleader. Well, if you turned all, you know, if you turned all your security and, and private privatization services on to where you're not sharing any cookies or anything, that's why. Because without any of that data, People just have to advertise everything to everybody. Sure. Um, so to get ads that are more relevant to you actually requires you to give up some of that personalization. And for each person, they just at this point they just have to decide what level of that they're comfortable with, and then try and find the according settings. Or if an app won't give you the choice, then you just gotta kick it. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy just to think about. You know, when you from an experience perspective, when I go to the sites, I it just use Google or do anything, I, I have this expectation from ads, especially that they should be relevant. And I get, I get kind of offended when they're not, you know, I'm like, why are you showing like, that's nothing to do with me. You know, I'm the guy that goes and clicks and says, hide this ad. Don't, this is not something relevant for me. Right. Yeah. Which has turned out to be helpful. Uh, Cause in like social media and stuff like that, when I go and I actually look and interact with posts and I interact with that stuff, I'm teaching the algorithms I don't want to see that, you know, for, for a long time, probably because of my age and gender, uh, I got, I got targeted with just, just endless promotional videos of people getting injured on Facebook. <laughs> you know, it's like, come watch this guy fall down a set of stairs and break his neck. And I'm like, I don't want to see that. <laughs> I, I, there's a space for that. People want to see it. I don't want to see it. And so I had to continuously go in and just be like, don't, no, no, no. And it took a couple of months, but uh, I stopped seeing those. I stopped seeing those brutal yeah. knockouts on MMA, uh, which again, mm -hmm. it's not my cup of tea. I don't really want to see that stuff. Uh, so I stopped getting all those ads, but it took a while to actually like teach it and say, hey, this is, this is what's going on. But in doing that, I was consciously thinking, okay, they're building a better profile on me, somebody, mm -hmm. somewhere uh, that they're going to use to monetize on. And I kind of, I'm kind of okay with that. I'm kind of okay with they're making money off of me, but they're also providing me a service that I'm just to say this. I mean, if you were a kid, I know, I know you, you know this. If you ever had to get directions off the internet and print them off 
from MapQuest. <laughs> so you or used a MapsGo if you are even older, uh, which I had a delivery job one time where I had to use a MapsGo and it was crazy. Uh, I had these little cryptic notes that would like go to page five, grid A two, and that's <laughs> where the street is or building you're trying to go to. Anyways, yeah. Um, but like having those services now where I can just pull up my phone or even say, you know, hey Siri, whatever, uh, hey Google, and then they just do the thing and plug it in on my, I plug it into my new Honda Accord, plug my new iPhone in there, and then it takes me where I need to go. It's just like turn here, turn there, turn there. And all those all those interactions and so forth are are helpful and beneficial to me, and it's, it's worth the trade-off, right? Like I'm, I'm willing to give you my email, and I'm willing to give you some of my search history and so forth. Uh, so that you can make my life easier, you know, I'm okay mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. I think a lot of it too comes down to the granularity of the permissions. Um, because there's weird stuff in some of these apps, right? Like, um, I, I remember, I don't remember what app it was, but there was some app that was very basic, like a notes app or something. And it's like, I installed it and it's like, do you give permission to use your camera and your microphone? And I was like, no. And then it just turned around. It's like, okay, you can't use this app without, you know, and it makes it mandatory to have all these permissions. I was like, first of all, these things are not required to use a, a a notes app. Right. I just type stuff. So I think potentially some more sophisticated laws around companies not being able to require things in the terms of service or in the apps permissions that give you just blanket permission to use everything to even make your product work um, are good. Now, if you have a camera app and you don't give permission to the camera, then that's very reasonable, right? I think that's something we can agree to. Yeah. Um, And the other thing is, one thing at least I like about my, my current Android phone is in some cases I can give permission only when the app is open. So I can say, all right, well, I'm going to give this app permission to um, view my camera roll because it has to view my camera roll in order to be able to import a photo to edit a photo. But I don't need this app having permission to use my camera and my camera roll all the time. Yeah. And, you know, the permission around what happens with that, right? Am I giving the app permission so that it can process the thing on my phone? Or is it is it uploading all my pictures back to the app person you know the app developers server somewhere right yeah it seems like every app now that you download is they want to know your location and i'm like you know mm-hmm. you don't need to know my location i'm playing angry birds like <laughs> right. why do you need to know where i'm at right um I, I get it from an advertising perspective if somebody wants to geolocate you or whatever for advertising but outside of that i think you're right around the the granular permissions i think the uh the direction that um uh our friends in, in, at Apple are going with their iOS and, and so forth in terms of like notifications that you're starting to see when apps are using certain things. You'll see, you know, when you open up Facebook, it's like it, there's like a little yellow dot now. Uh, and that mm-hmm. indicates that it's using services, it's using location services and things that you've turned on. Um, and then, you know, if you enabled it for everything, I think it will show a green dot where it's like you've enabled it for microphone and camera and everything else. And I'm like, you don't need any of that. So. Um, yeah, but not to go too far down in that realm of craziness. And I do appreciate you talking to me about that. Uh, I want this to be some useful for some people, uh, to talk about SEO. And I want to talk about SEO from kind of the beginner's guide to SEO. I know, I know we've just spent a few minutes in like the crazy deep, dark web stuff. That's, uh, that's (laughs) scary to people, but let's say I'm starting a new business and I just want to make, I want to get a website and I want to build a website. And I want to make sure, you know, I've contacted a guy named Mike and Mike builds websites and I built the forum. And then I'm like, okay, we need to optimize it for SEO. What do you think, you know, what would be some of your kind of beginner guide, you know, first steps to things that you would say are the most impactful starting points for like, I guess, SEO 101? Mm-hmm. Um, well, to start it for small businesses is, is really tough, to be frank. Uh, it's, it's a hyper competitive landscape. And um, there's something called domain authority that you can get a measure on from a a fairly inexpensive tool called Moz. I don't recall if you can get it for free from there. You you might need a a small paid subscription, but it's a very inexpensive SEO tool. But that's essentially a measure of how sort of strong and authoritative your site is on the web. And when you start a new website, you essentially start from zero. Um, 
and there are several things that lead into whether your website ranks right now i'm not going to go into them because i can't name all of them and actually the people at google can't tell you all of the factors <laughs> Because they have thousands of PhDs working on it, and they make hundreds of changes to the algorithm of the year, and they sent AI off in its own corner to go start tweaking the algorithm on its own with no human intervention. So actually, Google doesn't even know everything that's happened to their search algorithms. Um, but there are some core things, and they are you know, your content, what it's about, um, the technical aspects, which you're a little more well-versed on, Mike, include things like site speed, and not having a bunch of junky code, um, you know. Uh, and, and frankly, the algorithms at this point are looking at things like they're actually looking at the design because they can yeah. analyze the code and figure out what it looks like and understand how people interact with that and what makes it a good and bad experience because they have so much data. Uh, and then the idea of things kind of pointing into you. So when I think about a small business, you know. You, you probably want to do some basic things to optimize, but you also want to consider how big a part SEO is going to be of your strategy because it might be a big part and it might not need to be a big part. There might be other ways that are better ways to spend your time and money. So when I think about the general idea of sort of content marketing and SEO and social all together, um, I've got like four principles that make everything go around. It's link, like, search, and share. Uh, and basically, you want to make stuff that people link to. You want to make stuff that people like, right? It's people that are looking for and people share. If you're a small local business, the chances of you competing on doing some content marketing push around like, I'm going to start the, um, I don't know, the carpenters, be the best carpenting blog, and that's going to be my business funnel for a small local carpentry shop probably not super realistic you might become an internet celebrity if you make an amazing youtube channel so that's totally viable um but unless you're shipping stuff all over the country that's also a very broad kind of thing to do right sure um so there are social aspects that you can do in, in that respect i think the very very first thing i would do is probably go claim my google my business listing now i'm talking about people who are very location-based, right? If you're some sort of consultant and you'll fly all over wherever and it doesn't matter where your customers are, you can ignore this because you're in a very different situation. Yeah. But most small businesses are going to compete best on a local level, on a localization type strategy because they are confined to a physical area and it's way easier to compete with your local area than it is to compete with the whole world. I had this, this myself when I had my website. Um, and I was living in Houston. So I revised my website. I've had a website for a long time. It's gone through many revisions. But I looked around and blogging was big at the time, right? right. Um, blogging's taken a little bit of a back seat. And I thought to myself, all right, I need to rank for something like copywriter because that was the main thing I was doing at the time. And I looked around and I, I did some research and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to rank for like copywriter or conversion copywriter. There are people with entire companies and like, strong online followings. But I thought, well, I'm not trying to be the copywriter everywhere. I'm not trying to be the copywriter for Sarasota, Florida, sure. or from Billings, Montana. I'm trying to be the copywriter for Houston. My website is to get me a job if and when I need it. And so I, I applied a simple localization strategy. It didn't even require keyword research. Very simple thing to add to meta titles, meta descriptions, and on page. Houston copywriter or Houston area copywriter. Well, guess what? That small tweak put me to position three on page one. Wow. Now that might be more competitive today, but literally just putting the localization modifier took me from not ranking for anything to page three or not page three, but to position three for Houston copywriter. And the only person who outranked me there was one guy, he owned both sites that outranked me, <laughs> and his domain, his actual domain was Houston Copywriter, and he was my boss at the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you, he went all the way in on that one. It's like Houston Copywriter, went, Houston, Houston, <laughs> Houston. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and if it was more competitive, you can look at, you can look at local contractor, subcontractor type people like fence builders or plumbers sure. and look at their sites. And sometimes it looks a little spammy. But as long as it's useful information and you're not being junky about it, like I could put in a list 
if I was working on an actual web page, right, I could put a list of not just, you know, I'm, I'm in the Dallas area now, but I could say, you know, Dallas area copywriter, or maybe have a page that has a variation of DFW, Metroplex, right. and I could even, you know, North Texas, and then I could even have maybe on a location page or a services page something saying like, serving Plano, McKinney, Allen, blah, right. blah, blah. And that's all true, right? Yeah. Um, I've even seen some that'll go down to the level of listing zip codes, which is probably more of people who are going to be looking for like, you know, a drive through or something uh, like a like a drive through, you know, food place or something. Right, right. So it's probably not like a services approach, but I've seen people get that granular with it. And just that level of localization sends a strong message that you are about this service in this area and the competition for that's just going to be way less, and the co and the people you are going to attract are going to be way more qualified. Yeah, that's a really critical thing you're talking about there. I think um, I, I think you know having in the past in my past lives before the the job that uh, I'm working now, and I know you through, um, I was building these smaller localized websites for folks. And back then, I mean, this is years, many years ago. Um, you know, the localization wasn't that big of a deal. And it seemed like when every time we would build a site, it was always, it was always like this grandiose global approach, right? When people would sit down and say, <laughs> I'm going to build a website. And it's like, well, who are you building it for? I'm building it for the earth. I'm building it for the world, <laughs> right? Like everyone's going to yeah. want to know about my thing um, that, that I have out there. And I think it's important for folks to really just, you know, set your expectations correctly. I mean, yes, if you're, if you're doing e-commerce, if you're selling something through online or a service through on online, you know, whether it be, you know, fitness coaching or whatever, like, cause the sky's the limit these days for stuff like that. I mean, you can do, I've seen all kinds of fun, uh, programs you can sign up for like working out drum lessons, piano lessons, and you know, that aren't ge geographically locked because you do them through Skype or Zoom or, you know, whatever it might be, uh, video conferencing. Mm -hmm. So those are a little different, but you know, your plumbers, your, uh, your folks that are just geo locked, right? Like somebody that has to actually go and do something, a service for you, provide a service for you. Um, or even just the convenience of meeting with somebody. Right. And you know, when you look at agencies that are out there and ad agencies and, and web agencies and so forth, I think the ones that I find that are most successful that I like to work with are the ones that are very much geo locked. You know, even though I may work with somebody out of Baltimore or or uh, Philadelphia or Houston or in different places, I feel like their presence in that market is big, right? They have a really big presence. It just happens to be mm -hmm. through a network of people that I've come in contact with them. I found them. I've talked to them. They weren't trying to advertise to me in Dallas, right? They weren't trying to be like, hey, what are you doing in Dallas? Even though, you know, Houston's only four hours away. They're, they're all everything they've done is very much geo locked to that area, and it's nice because I think once you start, if you do come in from the outside to those areas, you start to see their presence is big. You know, they've got a ton of customers in that market. They've got a lot of presence in that market. They're in all of the the groups, uh, you know, in the side groups and so forth, and they know all the people and the players in that market. And you feel you feel like okay, well these guys are good. We'll give them a chance to if we're out of market. But that part of just making sure. A simple thing like Houston, Dallas, Grand Prairie, Plano, you know, the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex is, is uh, <laughs> it's becoming chall more challenging, I think, because <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I, from a services perspective, I've got folks, uh, you know, I've had to have some repairs done on my house in recent times. I've had folks coming from Terrell, Texas. And Terrell, Texas is used to feel like that was forever away. It's an hour. It's mm -hmm. probably an hour and a half, hour forty five minutes from my house, and that used to be like no man's land. Nobody, nobody's coming from Terrell, Texas. But now there's like <laughs> all these people that are coming to work on my house or do different jobs around in our community. They're willing to come an hour and forty five minutes. Uh, and so this Metroplex area is probably a hard one because it's growing uh, wide and tall uh, all at the same yeah. time into this crazy giant uh, area. Uh, this also uh, kind of almost getting to like a geo, uh, some issues around geo fencing, right? In terms of like mm -hmm. where where our office is. Um, so everybody that's listening, you'll hear me reference this. Hal and I work together currently. Um, where our office is in Plano, like that's as far north as I'm ever going to drive, right? But there's <laughs> like 
McKinney, Allen, all these places way up north that are building out and starting yeah. to do more and more and more and more stuff. And so it's kind of like that's starting to be another stake to me. You know, it's like I'm not going to go cross. <laughs> I'm not crossing 635 uh, for much longer because that's a you know that's like going across the border or something. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's interesting that, that to go bring it back uh, from my rambling here around the just the localization piece and how impactful that is and easy. You talked about Google My Business. Um, that is just going to Google and literally Googling Google My Business, and then they walk you through how to set it up. I, if I understand correctly, I think all you need is a phone number and address, and I don't even think you have to display the address. I think you can just say you have it. Like if you're working from home and you don't want to advertise your home address as your business address. Um, and then a couple of other little points about your business, and I think you're up and running. Yeah, it's super simple to get started, and you can build it up more robust over time. Um, but it's it's so basic to just exist there, and it's really important because if you don't exist there, you kind of don't exist. Like such an insane amount of traffic for people looking for things around them, near them, goes through Google Maps and doesn't even go through normal Google. Uh, and even when it does go through Google, it just gets you right back over to Google Maps that like. You know, if I'm looking for a chimichanga restaurant and it's not on Google Maps, guess what? I didn't find you. You're not in the consideration set. Yeah. Uh, It's very unlikely that I had some other rando touch point that you probably would have had to pay for for me to know that you exist. So you might as well at least be on the list. Yeah. Uh, And then it can really be enhanced because people can upload photos on your behalf, right? Um, You have customers who can post reviews, and the more reviews and photos you have, more well the hopefully more likely people will be to go you know if you're if you're if your place is legit people will flock and if it's not you know if you have a bunch of terrible reviews then maybe maybe it's not working in your favor but um and those things ultimately go back and influence your website right so you google my business you can link to your website which is a nice traffic source and if you have more reviews on your google my business that's going to help boost the rankings of your website and, and so on and so forth. So those two things can really just become a self-reinforcing cycle. Yeah. That's really cool that there's, you know, I think the important message that I want to draw out for folks in this, especially if you're starting off, is that it doesn't take a lot of money. You don't have to spend a lot of uh, a lot of money just to get the basics, right? And, and you know, a Squarespace site, and I'll speak from a tech perspective. That's my background. That's what I love. Uh, from a tech perspective, Squarespace is a great place to build a website. And I think it's like 20 bucks a month and you have a business website, you know, and it's fancy and flashy. Uh, there's some other services out there that do the same. And so, you know, for 140 bucks a year plus maybe an hour, two hours, because you got to figure it out because you've never done it before to set up your Google My Business, you've got an online presence. I mean, you know, barring, let's say, you know, content, <laughs> you got to put some content on your website if you're going to have a website. Uh, but it could be as simple as, you know, uh, best chimichangas in the DFW area. Here's our locations. Here's our Yelp reviews. Here's our Google reviews. Um, here's how to contact Show me a picture. Us. Here's I a need picture. to see that chimichanga. <laughs> yeah, here's a picture of, you know, raving fans, you know, like pulling your social feeds and so forth if you can um, to pull that together. And, and you've got a site and you've got a site that works and, and will get people to do what they need it to do. So. Keeping it simple. Uh, so let's kind of jump into something else and just similar similar um, tangential thoughts here around you know, like where you see, where you've seen kind of, you've been a part of the evolution, working deeply in the evolution of where SEO was years ago to where it is today. Do you, what do you see as into the future of SEO? Is it, a, is it basically the same, the same car with a new paint job? Uh, do you feel like it's going in a different tech direction? Is there is there a lot more considerations that you feel like you need to make, or can you hold those old school relevant? You know your your LLSS. I remember those, and I'll remember what the words are later. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you can just hold those true, do you think that those will be enough in you know two years, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years down the road? So I think those will be relevant for a very long time. And and I think they're even relevant well beyond SEO, right? Because they're just a general sort of content marketing approach. Your con, you know, if you, if you're doing a content marketing sort of thing, it might not even include SEO as one of your pillars. Not everyone survives on that. It's not a great fit for everyone. 
you might lead with social, right? You might lead with YouTube, whether or not you consider that part of social. You might lead with thought leadership and talking at events uh, and probably combine that with other media approaches. Um, so I think the link, like, search, and share are going to remain very consistent because links are a huge signal that don't seem to be going away any soon for SEO. Um, relevant keywords seem to be playing a big role, even though it's evolving how exactly they play in. As you mentioned in the early days, you could just keyword stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, you could just you could just put the word in the page like 40 times and you would rank better than someone who put the word in the page 30 times or you could write it in white at the bottom of the site so it didn't actually sh look like it showed up. But the search engines have gotten smart to all of that. And so they're doing a lot more to you know, act sort of human-esque and understand what something's about. So if you're using the right, not just the, the specific keywords, which still do play a part, whether they're there or not, but what what a page, or a, more importantly, a group of pages or a whole site is about, it processes that and understands the meaning. So using terms related to it, understanding not just hammering down on one keyword throughout a whole page or a whole site, but you know, also having related terms and related concepts that show you go either wide, more, more so deep than wide usually, but... Sure. Um, to, to make sure that you're not just a surface thing, right? That you're not putting up a page because I saw this term and I'm trying to optimize for it, but you can actually add value uh, for what people are looking for. Um, and then, you know, like and share, that doesn't, that doesn't require SEO. And those aren't necessarily directly SEO factors, but if people are sharing your stuff, more people are going to see your stuff. Right. So that's going to send more traffic. It's going to send more positive signals to the search engines. Your content's valuable. And that's going to give you more linking opportunities. The more people see your stuff, the more people might link back to it. So I think those things are all valid. Keywords have evolved as they start to understand more of the contextual. So it's not always an exact match. It's more about understanding a topic like a human, which is kind of cool, but can be kind of confusing because it's sort of like 3D chess. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated in how you think about putting together your content. Right. But if you're really knowledgeable about, about your subject, you're going to do that naturally. If I went out and asked a lawn guy, about the best way to fix my lawn, he's going to use a bunch of those stuff in his natural words because he knows about it. Right. And I think that's part of what the search engine is trying to get to is if you know, you know, but it's going to become harder and harder to fake it if you yeah. haven't done some research. Yeah, that authenticity um, part of it is, is really critical, I think. That's, you know, you can't, you can't fake that. Uh, you know, and I think, like you said, I think especially with natural language, programming and the way that the machine learning and the AI are starting to work, they're starting to understand the human language and how people would talk. And they, we've got, I don't even know how many hours of content on YouTube that I'm sure that they're pulling scripts from to understand language and how people like a lawn mowing service would talk about, you know, mm -hmm. how to sharpen your, your blade on your lawn mower. And, you know, if you don't know anything about it and you start saying, oh, I'm the expert on this and I'm going to write something up and you write it up. And then <laughs> it's like, uh, no, actually, uh, Jim Bob over here that has Jim Bob's lawn mowing service. Uh, yeah, that, that's the guy that's going to get ranked for it because he actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And I think another thing that's really critical that is related to something we mentioned earlier is I actually think branding is going to see a resurgence in importance. So if we go back to the, I'm not going to, certainly not the pre-internet days, but the early internet days, you know, the AOL days sure. and all that stuff. When major media was out there, you had big brands and you had to have a big brand, even if it was big in your, just in your area, so that people would know you and remember you and like you and trust you and want to buy from you. And if you let your foot off the pedal for too long, they were probably going to forget, right? So you advertise at a reasonably consistent level. Um, and I love what all this data has made us able to do in the idea of being hyper-targeted and trying to find just the people who are interested in our stuff. And for e-commerce, that may still be a lot of the way that things you know need to continue to go. Um, but I think some of that focus on just the hyper make this sale aspect of it has gotten a lot of people away from that idea of needing to do that broad kind of branding Sure. Or even, I, I don't mean broad in that you're reaching people who aren't relevant, but not something that's trying to get this sale of this product at this time. Right. And so 
one of the things, as you noted, right, less and less of these the search engine traffic is actually going to your website. Well, what's a what's a way to get people to your website or your social properties or your YouTube page or your Google My Business page? It's to have them actually know your name and that be a name that people can differentiate from other names. Right. Um, so one of the big aspects to me in the future of SEO may be having a really strong, well-known brand, however it is that you use different media to generate that, whether it's PR or speaking engagements or, you know, going viral somehow, yeah. um, or just being, you know, consistent on social for your niche. Um, I've seen a lot of people really own a space online and it's, it's, it's influencers and even micro influencers at this point. Um, you learn that that's the person who knows about that thing. So when you need that thing, you go to that person. Or when you ask people about that thing, that's the name people think about. Yeah. And so uh, a great example from, you know, probably the the mid 2000s was there was a there was an email company called Emma, right? Mailchimp was kind of the the reigning king at the point. Everyone right. knew about it. They're like if I need you know basic email for business, especially small business, like do MailChimp. Um, and so Emma was another one that was kind of coming up at the time. And I, I followed a series of design blogs and they actually all teamed up to create like an ad network um, that was like a private ad network because they all sort of collaborated with each other. And they had very, they didn't have a ton of ads. It was very clean, very minimalist. But every single day I would go to these sites because, again, it was the blog era, right? right. Um, you would have an RSS feed or sure. a reader and yeah, yeah. go to the same blogs every day. Um, and so every single day on these multiple sites, I would just see this little box, Emma, easy email marketing. And you you see that every single day for two years. If someone said, Hal, where do I need to go for easy email marketing? I would involuntarily say Emma. Right. Because I couldn't get it out of my brain. Yeah. In fact, it would take me a minute to remember that MailChimp was a thing because they had so incepted that. Um, they had taken over that number one spot in my brain by being so ever-present. And it, it wasn't big. It wasn't obnoxious. It was a very simple message. Just there. It wasn't just their logo either, though. Right. You know, It had to say at least email marketing. So I knew what they were about and why they were there. Yeah. Um, but that alone was enough to just like be in my brain. And so I think a lot of that's going to be important because you can occupy that con a spot in that consideration set in someone's mind where they're, where they're searching their own brain and not even searching online. Um, but additionally, if the search engines aren't going to send you any traffic, then you need to make sure that the third thing they're searching for is you because there's no other thing for them to do but send them to you right. when they search for you, right? Yeah. If you search for Emma, like Google doesn't have an Emma page like they're going to send you to that site. That's where you're going to go. Right. Unless they figure out some other crazy thing, which they might because they're very clever. Yeah. Um, but I think that's going to be a big component of it. So I think we can see a, a big resurgence with all of these people who were previously giving free traffic, turning everything kind of pay to play. And then things like YouTube getting hyper competitive. You can't just start up a YouTube channel and get all the views. Right. Like there are people who are professionals who make millions of dollars with entire teams. Um, and so me doing it on nights and weekends is going to have a really hard time competing with Peter McKinnon who has studios yeah. and like probably a dozen people who work for him, uh, help him make his videos all the time. Yeah. That's a, that's actually, um, it's a consideration I've had with this, this podcast, video cast, whatever you want to call it. One, I don't have a name for it. I don't have it branded. I don't know if I'm going to have it branded. Uh, we're not sure what we're going to do with that part of it. I've got some guests lined up in the future that are probably going to help me talk through that and, uh, and figure some things out, some mutual colleagues that we, that we know. Um, but it, that, that is important. I mean, I, I, as I thought about this whole thing, uh, this, is not my, this is not my job. Like, I, I don't, I'm only doing this because I want... I feel like I have access to some of the smartest people in marketing and some of the smartest people in technology. And so I wanted to be able to document that and share that with friends and people. I don't have a studio. This is as much as I'm going to do. I, I won't, I mean, <laughs> the, all I did before this is I, I used, I set up my GoPro 
as as a as a webcam because of the angle and the weirdness of the other the one just on my Mac and I put some headphones on and I'm using my, my microphone out of here. I have a Yeti microphone, but for some reason I'm not smart enough to know how to use it right because every time I try to use it, it literally picks up every noise everywhere within five mile radius. And so I got to figure that out. But to your point about that, of like probably a dynamic versus condenser mic thing. Yeah. I I, I got to do some work with it. Um, but you know, to your point about this, I mean, like in starting something like this, if somebody sat down and said, Hey, I'm going to start something like this. I think you got to set your expectations, right? Like you're not going to be the next Logan Paul. If you decide you're going to start a YouTube channel, right? Like that's not my intention here. My intentions are to keep it pretty small. Talk to my friends, talk to the people I know that are colleagues of mine that, that are really smart, share these things, document this stuff. Maybe this is helpful for somebody. Maybe nobody listens to this, but me, uh, I don't even think my mom will listen to this because it's not interesting <laughs> to her. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where I think it's important for you to set your expectations right when you're doing any of this stuff, whether it be building websites, SEO, any of that stuff, to what you think you can actually influence, what you're willing to put your time and effort into and what you want to focus on. And if your website is the most important thing, then you need to go deep in that. You need to put all your time and attention on the website you can't put all your time and attention on the website and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Clubhouse. That's the new one, which I don't get. I I'm, I'm still don't like that app, uh, <laughs> social thing or whatever. YouTube, all these other places. Like you, you got to pick them. You got to pick what you're going to go into, and you got to own that space in terms of like the effort you're going to put into it. Um, you can put some passive effort into it if it's interesting to folks. They'll find it. Uh, I've done some YouTube videos, uh, reviews on old cameras. I'm really into old cameras, uh, film cameras and things like that. I do some reviews of those old cameras. I found what's interesting is that when I first put them out, they have zero traffic to them. But then about a year later, people start finding them somehow. And I think it's just because, you know, somebody bought a camera at a garage sale and is trying to figure out how to make it work again or something. I mean... I'll pick on this one. This is right next to my desk here. This, this, uh, to not get too off, this, this old Nikon digital camera, I probably have like 10,000 views on me reviewing this camera. I got this free from somebody. I, I wouldn't expect that that, you know, I've got some other cameras that are very expensive and, and very niche and everybody loves them and they, everybody talks about them. But what's interesting is not a single person I think has made a, a video about this one specific camera. Um, and so that may be from a content perspective, you know, kind of segue into content a little bit. I mean, I think if you start to look and see, like, everybody's talking about this. Well, maybe you shouldn't talk about that. Maybe you should talk mm -hmm. about something next to it, uh, you know, that's related or go in one spot in that, in that content realm and go deep into that. Um, because I think that's where you're going to find value. I mean, what do, what do you think about that? Yeah, Absolutely. So search engines are kind of quirky in that um, you kind of need to, when people zig, you need to zag. You need to go where people aren't. Yeah. Um, I love I love the analogy of Walmart. Whether or not you like Walmart, they did a very smart thing when they built up the business. They started in lots of rural, underserved areas. Now, they ended up, in many cases, displacing small local businesses, which not everyone is a fan of. But what they did was they took their store to somewhere where there wasn't a lot of competition. And they got enough money to start another store and another store and another store. Before you know it, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of stores across rural America. And they're a household name in rural America. And once they've established that base head, they're a multi-billion dollar company. Then they start creeping into the suburbs, right? Sure. Yeah. And and they haven't even really, um, I think Target has only in the past, you know, five years started trying to come up with special concept stores to go into like dense urban city cores. Right. But Target's, you know, Target's a little bit more suburban, a little less rural, but they, ha they occupy a kind of a similar space, right? So they go where they have an acceptable level of competition to establish a beachhead, and then maybe they can eventually win in the big places. But again... You're not going to find a Walmart typically in a downtown in the U.S. of A., right? Much like you're probably not going to find a Target, especially for a couple of uh, select ones. And so the thing is really the same with search. 
go where people aren't. It's going to be easy to win. You can build an empire in the rural part of search engines where people are not making content for that stuff. You could you could have a whole landscape of things that are obscure niche down topics, and you could potentially have more to, you know more traffic than a big site just because you're covering stuff no one else is. Because when someone searches for a question um, on a search engine, which is usually Google, they're trying to get an answer to a question. There's a question implicit in every single search anyone ever does. Yeah. And you know if you if anyone has seen the graphs, if you're not on page one, it's it almost doesn't matter. It's like 93% of the clicks are on page one. And something like, I don't know, 60, 75% of the clicks are in the top three results, organic results. So you want to be pretty high up there. Um, but when people do a search and they don't see stuff that looks like what they, do, what they want, they don't go further down in the results. They don't keep scrolling. They don't go to page two. They redo the search. They add more words to it. They change the words, but usually they niche down. So they start with a three-word search, and they're like, well, that's not specific enough. They add a fourth word, a fifth word, a sixth word, a seventh word. They start adding pluses and minuses if they know a little bit about Boolean operators until they finally get to something that looks relevant. And so um, I heard a story about someone who they had no YouTube presence, right? They weren't trying to make a channel or anything. But in the same sort of altruistic way, there are people who just do altruistic non-business things on YouTube. And they had done the installation of some obscure part inside like a Toyota Tacoma or yeah. something, right? Yeah. And evidently, even though it was super janky, it was like homemade on a phone, bad audio, questionable lighting. Um, you know, it was the sun. The sun was the only thing that was happening. Right. They did a video on how to replace this one part in this one model of this one year. And it ended up with tens of thousands of views because no one else had done it. Right. Yeah. And I think about that same thing, right? Because YouTube is a search engine. Like if you look at the ranking of search engines, YouTube is still ahead of Bing and DuckDuckGo and all that stuff, even broken away from Google. Right. Uh, And then, of course, Google serves up YouTube results on top of it. So going back to the whole pepper example, right? Um, as you know, I, I make some of my own hot sauce. That's fun, you know, tying back all the whole spicy thing. Yeah. But um, I have considered, I'm not a green thumb, but I have considered trying to grow my own peppers. And guess what? That's a highly intensely local thing. I understand, even though I don't know the details, that climates have a big impact on growing vegetables or fruits. Yeah, sure. And so if I'm going to go in and look how to do that, I'm not just going to go and look at how to do peppers. I'm like, when do you need to plant um, cayenne peppers in North Texas? Yes. North yeah. Texas, Texas is big enough. The Panhandle, South Texas, West Texas, like we're in a different time zone from West Texas. It's a completely different climate. So I need to know when to plant stuff here. And it could vary based on the breed, right? So if you were a person who was trying to sell pepper seeds, you could make a video on on how to, you know, when to plant cayenne in north texas and tabasco in north texas and green peppers in north texas and jalapenos in north texas and you could potentially turn around and do it all for san antonio and do it all for brownsville in the valley and do it all for el paso and that's just trying to get you know that's just trying to take care of part of texas yeah yeah that's very interesting um that was a question i was going to ask you and, and and you know to be respectful of your time here i know we're getting close to the hour um hobbies and things that you do to de-stress i know we and this is more of a this is more of a self-facing personal thing that i want to deal with you know i, I get stressed about work we're we're in a very competitive environment uh at a stressful position uh you know being in charge of tech it's 24 7 365 you know and so forth so i have to go out of my way to do things to de want to uh, you know de-stress unwind and create hobby spaces for me to just get away from what's going on. And so I wanted to talk to all the people that I talked to and say, what is it that you do? You know, how do you handle stress? How do you de- how do you unwind? What are your hobbies? What do you do to, you know, when you're not thinking about SEO, you know, directly, uh, what are the things that you do on your side job, you know, on the side or in other ways that bring you back to when you are back in the PPC, SEO, content, CRO world that you're like hyper-focused, you've got all the energy and and excitement to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a couple of hobbies. Uh, I collected hobbies for a little while, I think. <laughs> um, but I've really narrowed down on, on fewer of them. So um, I enjoy fiction writing, um, sort of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, that kind of stuff, mostly short stories. Um, I also do photography, uh, as a lot of people do. That's a, that's a pretty fun hobby for me. Um, and, and the third big one is actually making my own homemade hot sauce. And I have gravitated, especially during quarantine, to that third one. And I think there's a really big reason for it. Um, as you mentioned, we're in digital marketing, right? We spend all day sitting on a chair, looking at screens, messing with stuff on the internet. Um, in some cases, trying to make things pretty or function better, you know, for web pages and all that stuff. Yeah. And so when I get to the end of the day, I, it took me a while to realize why it was that I was having trouble doing my hobbies. Cause at the time, again, fiction writing and photography were kind of the ones that were leading the way for me. Um, photo editing to actually put the photos out yeah. and the act of the act of writing were both acts that were again on a screen and i just can't spend all day on a screen doing stuff on my computer and then go and then try and spend the rest of the day on those same screens doing more stuff that looks like the stuff that i was doing earlier even if the actual purpose is a little different sure um I mean, I am a little bit old school. I do watch some TV. I do play some console games. But at least that's a different type of screen in a different room. Um, it's a little bit of a different interaction mechanism. Uh, but the hot sauce one, I really gravitated towards. And I feel like it's because there's no screens involved. It's a very, it's a physical act, right? Yeah. And once you get past the first couple of batches and you start to learn what you're doing, you get a lot of the concepts locked into your head. So... It can really be one of those things um, that's sort of second nature. And I won't call it autopilot, but it's just a different part of your brain you can work out and a different part of your brain you can rest. Yeah. I know there's people who like to do things like um, carpentry, and there can be a certain sort of zen aspect to doing something physical that's not requiring a particularly, you know, the kind of analytical mindset we might use right. during the course of our work day. Um, and it's a creative thing. So at the end of it, it feels like you've produced something like there's a tangible physical thing I can touch at the end of that process that I can go. Cause I mean, even though we do a lot of stuff, I'll admit doing digital stuff for work or for hobby at the end of the day, sometimes it feels a little hollow because we're physical beings and we want to touch a physical thing. And even right. if you make an amazing website, you're like, this is all just code on a server somewhere. Right. Um, and that can serve a very important function and it can create a lot of satisfaction or a lot of utility. Um, but I think there's a different kind of satisfaction just based on the way the human brain works to, to creating or manipulating a physical object. Um, and then of course I get the fringe benefit of after I've actually done the activity, then I get to eat it and it's delicious. Uh, I can attest it is delicious. Um, very good. Uh, very good on tacos. Very good on eggs. Uh, I've had several of kinds. So um, that's I, that's really important. I think uh, a lot of folks, especially coming up, I think younger folks and even older, it's a good reminder just to, to unplug, step away from your computer, especially right now with all the COVID stuff going on. It's hard to disconnect. It's hard to get away from stuff. Um, I always kind of make the joke uh i started playing disc golf at the beginning of covid actually you know this is funny tomorrow uh i don't know when this is going to come out but um to the public but tomorrow in today's time uh is the one year anniversary of my first round of disc golf and uh i'm proud of that because i, I it's something like you said it's it's something i picked up just because it's like it's not technical like in terms of um i, I don't need a computer to do it i need some pieces mm -hmm. of plastic and I go into the woods and I throw these pieces of plastic around and there's physics and there's, you know, geometry and all kinds of stuff that you got to figure out. And there's, you know, a physical activity to it. And it's just like golf and there's a golf score at the end of the day. And so it's fun, but I think it's that, it's that being able to just get out, go touch a tree. Uh, I say that to a lot of my friends. I'm like, Hey, I need to go touch a tree today. Let's go play disc golf. And, uh, it's just to get away from, these flat screens and see something in three dimensions, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so anyways, it's very good. I, I appreciate your time today. Um, 
Any parting thoughts, anything you think we need to cover that we didn't cover? Anything you want to plug? Websites, social media platforms, hot sauces, <laughs> any of that stuff. Plug away, man. I, I got all kinds of stuff I could plug. Uh, I'm easy to find on the web at halwerner.com. That's H-A-L-W-E-R-N-E-R.com. I'm at Hal Werner on almost all the you know social platforms I've chosen to participate in, which is not all of them. Because as Mike uh, referenced earlier, don't spread yourself too thin or you can just suck at a lot of things instead of being good at a few things. Um, I, um, I, am, I am contemplating trying to go uh, trying to turn this hot sauce thing into a business. Uh, a lot of people seem to enjoy it. I don't have all the pieces in place, so I suppose that one's a little bit a little bit of a standby moment, uh, but I'll be more than happy to toss out a website and links if any of that stuff comes available. Awesome. When you decide, you open platform here to promote the hell out of your hot sauce. Let's come on and talk hot <laughs> sauce. Uh, this podcast is intended for us to just to have a good time and enjoy stuff. So, Hal, thank you so much for your time. I know that's the most precious thing you have. So I appreciate that uh, and all the information. And I'd love to have you back on in a few more episodes. Successful episode number one. We're keeping our fingers crossed that it actually recorded and it's going to <laughs> actually be able to do anything with it despite all the error messages I kept getting while this is going on. So we're going to test this out. But uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, we will uh, chat again. You got it. Thanks right. for having me. Peace.